Perfect. So I, I'm Tudor Allen. I'm the archivist at Camden Local Studies and Archive Centre. Thank you for joining us for the talk tonight. I'm delighted to welcome as our speaker tonight, Emma Yandel. Emma is the Curator and Collections Manager at Chawton House in Hampshire, where her latest exhibition, Trailblazers, Women Travel Writers and the Exchange of Knowledge is on view until the 26th of February 2023, and it includes loans from us here at Camden Local Studies and Archive Centre. Now, Emma previously worked at the Foundling Museum, which is close to where I am now, in Bloomsbury, and a little further afield um, in the National Maritime Museum in Amsterdam. And she holds a Master's in Museum Studies from the University of Amsterdam and a BA in English Language and Literature from the University of Oxford. When Lady Mary Wortley Montague, a famous society woman, died in 1762, she left behind a manuscript of letters written during her time in Turkey. They contained first-hand observations of life in a Muslim country from the position of women to early forms of vaccination. Now, despite her family's best efforts, these letters were published the following year and they caused a sensation. But how did they make it into print? In her talk tonight, Emma Yandel will follow the trail from a reverend in Rotterdam to a publisher on the Strand and to a little known manuscript here in Camden Local Studies and Archive Centre. So without more ado, I'll pass you over to Emma to share her screen and start the presentation. Wonderful, thank you so much, Tudor. Now let's just get this up. Hopefully you can now all see my screen. Uh, so thank you so much, Kate and uh, Tudor for inviting me to do this talk this evening and indeed for um, giving me access to this fantastic um, collection of manuscript items that you have in Camden Archives and Local Study Centre, which um, as Kate kindly mentioned at the beginning, I've been able to borrow some of to have on display uh, in my exhibition, Trailblazers. So, um, so it's a real pleasure to be here this evening and to be able to dive a bit deeper into what I think is an absolutely fascinating story of um, a woman who is known increasingly within academic circles, but still hasn't gained the widespread um, uh, popularity and fame uh, that I think she deserves. And also a fascinating story about how the books of the past come into being what are the steps that have to take for a book to actually uh, be published? So that's why my title is From Paper to Print, The Hidden Manuscript of Lady Mary Watley Montague's Turkish Embassy Letters. And I will start by saying her name is a real mouthful. So um, no shade to anyone who stumbles over that. Before I get started, there's just a quick thing I wanted to say about terminology within this talk. So I'm talking about a woman who uh, was born in the 17th century and died in the 18th century. Um, so there is terminology within her writings that we would no longer deem acceptable and in many instances might deem racist today. Um, I'm not going to be highlighting any language that I believe to be problematic, but I do want people to be aware that there is gonna be historic terminology at times and I hope I've struck um, a good balance between uh, revealing uh, what she talks about versus doing anything that might cause offence but I'm very happy to discuss that in the Q&A or, or privately afterwards. Um, there will also be some reference to the historic place names so I'll be talking about Constantinople and Adrianople um, which are no longer the names that we use um, to describe these places in Turkey, uh, but hopefully that won't cause too much confusion. Um, so I'll go to my first slide. So I've, I've set this talk up sort of into four parts. Um, and my first one is basically saying, why do I think Lady Mary Wortley Montague was important enough for me to be given 45-ish minutes to talk about her this evening. And indeed, who is she? Because um, 
she might be someone that some of you are familiar with. Um, she was actually brought up a little bit at the beginning of the pandemic for reasons that I'll, I'll get into later. But also, she is very much a figure of the 18th century, so I wouldn't be surprised if you hadn't heard of her. Um, in the intro that Kate gave, uh, she described her as a society woman and, and a wit. And those are very 18th century terms that are very um, appropriate to discuss Lady Mary Wortley Montague. But I'm actually not going to start by telling her who she is. I'm going to do a bit of a bait and switch. I'm going to start with sort of where the story tonight begins. And that's actually after Lady Mary Wortley Montague's died. She dies in um, August of 1762, but it's on the 7th of May, 1763, that something happens that completely changes her literary legacy. And that is the publication of this book that you can see here on the left. Now, this is the copy from Chawton House's collection, um, and you can see it's in quite poor condition. In fact, the front board, which is the book binding term we'd use for front cover, has actually um, been fully detached, which is why that paper is so um, browned and sort of dog-eared. This is volume one of the letters of the Right Honourable Lady M dash dash Y, W dash dash Y, M dash 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 E. Now, I always love this as the sort of 18th century and indeed earlier and later plausible deniability when publishing something. Uh, you might have noticed sometimes, even in say a Jane Austen novel, they'll talk about going to the house of and then there'll be dashes or dash shire. And uh, that's that sort of concealing the identity to an, a, a degree, but nobody would have been under any illusions as to who these letters were from. Written during her travels in Europe, Asia and Africa, to persons of distinction, men of letters, etc., and in different parts of Europe, which contains, and this is again how titles worked back in the day, titles were incredibly long and involved a lot of spoilers, which contains, among other curious relations, accounts of the policy and manners of the Turks, drawn from sources that have been inaccessible to other travellers. And it says it's published in three volumes by Mr. T. Beckett and P. A. De Hont in the Strand in 1763. Uh, so this is the first volume, as I said, but on the right next to that, I've got an advertisement that was taken from the Salisbury and Winchester Journal um, on the 16th of May, so really not long after it was published. This was quite a common thing, you'd have a section saying recently published, and it says, so they, they make liberal use of this day, when in fact it could have been actually a year earlier. It said, this day is published, beautifully printed in three pocket volumes, so they're nice and small, and it's priced at six, six, six shillings. And it says that it was sewed, so not fully bound, but the pages were all sewn together. So why am I starting with, uh, with this, um, this copy? Well, that's because um, Lady Mary Wortley Montague is best known now for this book of letters but she didn't actually put it into print herself in her lifetime. As I've told you, this comes out a year after she died. So how does it come to the marketplace? And I'll go on to tell you why it's such an important collection of works. But if in May, 1762, you were, uh, you were in London and you were wandering around St Paul's Church, you would be right in the thick of the book trade. Lots of printers and publishers will have St Paul's Churchyard on the title pages of their books because this was a place where there were a lot of books booksellers, including the now no longer existing Paternoster Row. Um, and this is uh, showing St Paul's Cathedral from a map that we have at Chawton House, a really large wall map um, by John Rock from 1746. So I wanted to put you in the place where you might be first seeing this book. Um, this book was Lady Mary Wortley Montague's letters that she had written during her stay in the then Ottoman Empire. She leaves England in 1716 and she um, she comes back in 1718. So this two year period, but also involves her, her traveling to uh, Constantinople where she, where she resides. Um, but I've started with my sort of hopefully intriguing question of how did this little volume come to be a year after its writer has died? And um, was it meant to come into print or not? And that's something that we'll consider throughout the talk, um, but, 
I would remind you to keep keep an eye on the people who printed this, Mr. T. Beckett and P. A. De Hond, because T. Beckett in particular is the reason why Camden Archives has an important link uh, to Lady Mary Wortley Montague. Oops. But who was she? So she was born in 1689 and she comes from um, nobility on both sides, um, but she had a, a difficult family upbringing. Her father was a bit of a rape and her mother died really young. So she spent time living in different family members' houses um, but didn't have that sort of secure early family unit. She was very dismissive of the sort of education that was offered to her. She made secret use of her father's library and she writes in a really young age, we have her writing about schooling herself, particularly in the class, hociously learned texts off by heart that would have been very much part of a, a son's education, but not a daughter's at this time. And she already started writing as a teenager and sort of circulating her writing amongst her friends. That would be in manuscript form, by which I mean just pieces of paper rather than printed works. And that was a very common way of um, circulating your writing at the time and something that Lady Mary Watley Montague makes use of. But in her early twenties, she meets a, a politician, Edward Watley Montague, and she really wants to marry him, despite the fact that her parents don't particularly and spend a lot of time, time trying to um, negotiate a marriage contract. Um, but she decides to elope, it's all taken too long. But that means that she doesn't have any sort of legal document giving her rights over specific like money and possessions, because legally at this point, um, those would all become property of her husband upon marriage. Um, she goes into London society and she, she, she sort of rises up to the upper echelons of the literary world. She attends court and she makes friends with lots of artists and writers, people who would go on to paint her, but also people like the writer Alexander Pope. So before she moves to Turkey, she is very much within the literary scene in London. However, she's not actively publishing. She's writing, she's writing poems, she's writing prose, and some of them did appear in print, but that was usually surreptitiously. So maybe she'd sent a poem to someone and then they snuck it into a journal. Um, and actually it's important to remember that at this point in time, there was a culture of uh, circulating by manuscript and it was actually often higher status not to be publishing your work in print, which was seen as sort of the grubby commercial realm. Um, so whilst we might not have a record of her books being published, we know that she circulated her writings. But then something hugely important for her life happens and indeed for her literary output. And that is that her husband is unexpectedly appointed to be British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. Um, at this point, um, the, the Turks and the Austrian, the Habsburgs, are um, in conflict. And his role was to go out there on behalf of Britain and try and sort of broker peace. So that means that the whole family, she's got a, she's got a, a young son at this point, are going to move out and live in Constantinople. And she thinks it would be for five years. It ends up actually only being for two. Um, and it's during this period that these letters that we have are written where she talks about her experiences of um, living in the Ottoman Empire and particularly her attention to detail of the lives and experiences of Muslim women. Now you might be noticing, well, she's writing these letters you've told me in 1716, 1718, but they're not being released until 1763. And on that title page, it says brand new information that no one's ever known before. Well, that was a very conventional thing that travel writing would do. Everything was from new sources. You've got to explain to people where they should buy it. But in Lady Mary Wortley Montague's case, even though her letters are published many decades after they were written, they still are revealing information about um, particularly the experiences from first-hand observations of, of Muslim women that hadn't been known in travel writing. And that gives you a real sense of how much writing at this time could be a huge delay from when it was written to when it was published. And so knowledge, particularly of other cultures is coming, maybe by the point it's coming, it's already out of date. Um, but uh, as I'll go on to talk about, there was information within her letters that um, really gave this sort of firsthand look, particularly from women's spaces that male travelers were not able to enter. Um, and was part of what made her letters so um, 
so intriguing. Now I'll speed up through her biography because this is the most important bit, but it's also important to say that she comes back to England. I'm gonna talk about um, her links to smallpox inoculation a bit later, but um, in 1736, she, she falls in love with this Italian polymath and in 1730, she leaves England ostensibly for her health. Her marriage with her husband has become estranged, but actually she goes to live with this man, Algarotti in Venice. And so someone who in the 1710s was a really um, sort of um, a society figure who was really um, uh, sort of um, aspired to perhaps or seen as this great wit suddenly is seen as this scandalous woman who's left her husband and gone off to live with a foreigner in a foreign country. So it's important to sort of know where her life gets to for thinking about when her works end up being published. Uh, but she does come back to England and I'll talk about her journey back to England because it's important to think about how her writing came to be. So this is, this is Lady Mary Wortley Montague. This is a portrait of her that we have in our collection at Chawton House. And this is showing her before she goes to Turkey in 1715. You can see she's been painted to look like a, a societal beauty. Um, and she's been painted by Charles Jabaz, who was a, um, a important society painter of the time. Now this was the beginning of 1715. At the end of 1715, she actually contracts smallpox and that leads her to get awful facial scarring. She uses, loses her eyelashes. Um, and it is something that particularly when she gets attacked in the press when she's come back from Turkey, her friend, earlier friend, Alexander Pope, turns against her and it's really sort of vitriolic attacks on her, which is part of why her reputation takes a long time to recover and, and our knowledge of her writing. Um, but that's again, another thing that if you can bear in mind is useful for thinking about what she's drawn to when she visits Turkey. Um, so these are her travels. This is a map that I, um, I made pulling information out from her travel writing for the exhibition Trailblazers that um, I curated and is currently on. So you can see she roughly sort of does the grand tour route, but she's making her way down to Turkey and that's where she ends up residing. <laughs> now, this is um, a engraving uh, of Lady Mary Wortley Montague created for well after her letters are published. Um, but I wanted to include it because it shows you sort of the before and after of how much her time in Turkey affected her, but also affected public perception of her. You, This is actually um, engraved after a, a drawing by another artist that our painting is a copy of. It all gets a bit um, mixed up with when artists are, are copying one another in contemporary manner. But you'll notice this is very much the same stance as our painting at Chawton. And actually the painting it's after shows Lady Mary Wortley Montague in a very similar manner to ours. It looks very similar. But you can see this is her before Turkey, and then this is how she's being depicted afterwards. And they've basically just taken the exact same, uh, I guess, profile uh, pose of her, but suddenly she's now wearing clothes that would immediately have jumped out to people as being um, from the Orient. Oriental is a term that we have to be careful about how we use now because it's had um, negative and, and racist connotations to it. But this idea of um, being drawn to the Middle East and the fringes of what was seen as Western Europe, because it was different in many ways to our culture, one being costume, is something that Lady Mary Wortley Montague sort of comes to symbolize. And she literally did start dressing in, in clothes that she acquired when she was con Constantinople. She talks about wearing, um, thinking, saying, writing, oh, you think I might be wearing a dress, but actually I'm wearing trousers because I can do that. And she would stop wearing a turban. And this is something she continued when she came back to England. So even though she wasn't necessarily, sorry, she wasn't publishing her experiences of Turkey, she was still known in society closely with the um, oriental aesthetic that was becoming really, really popular and being appropriated by um, by people in London in the 18th century. And I always just think it's particularly funny how much you see someone as just, just very much adapted an older work to, um, to fit with the dress they want to show her in at the time. So that was part one. It's a real whistle-stop tour through her biography. Um, but that's who she is. And those are sort of the main important points of her life. Now, part two. 
how did her letters make it into print? So this is the this is the book that we were we were talking about, um, and this was published uh, by Publishers on the Strand, um, and would have been sold sort of around St Paul's uh, in London. But the reason why it ends up coming to print actually doesn't link to someone in England. It links to the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. So Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, as I mentioned, she um, she'd moved out to Venice. She sort of self exiled herself, and she was writing to. Uh, her daughter back in England, who'd now become the Countess of Butte. And she also had a son that she had a very complicated relationship with increasingly. Um, but she's decided to come back to England in part because her estranged husband has died. So she needs to sort out his affairs, but also um, because she knows she's dying. She actually has cancer um, and she sort of reveals that um, slowly to her to her family. Um, but she's making her way back through um, through England and the Netherlands was one of the um, uh, convenient and established routes to travel back to England. Rotterdam was a port. So you see in a lot of travel writing, people arriving in Rotterdam from England or leaving from it. This is a map of Rotterdam um, in the 17th century, but giving you a sense of the fact of just an idea of what it was like as a Dutch city, because obviously a lot of people think of Rotterdam now having post it being um, embalmed in World War II, uh, but it really looked a lot more like Amsterdam back in the time when Lady Mary Wortley Montagu was visiting. So she's traveling back to England. And one thing that she has kept with her throughout her life so when she was in London, when she was living in Venice, are two rather battered leather bound volumes. And those are her copies of what becomes her letters from Turkey or often called the Turkish embassy letters, even though actually some of them are written from other countries in Europe. So you might be thinking, well, why does she have copies of these letters? They're letters, so they were surely sent. Um, but that's what's interesting in particular about the publication of letters at this point in the 18th century and particularly travel writing letters because um, travel writing often used the form of the letter as a way of communicating information about a place it could be very easily it's a good setup for saying i'm here you're in another place i'm going to explain this to you so letters and travel writing you have to approach with a degree of scrutiny because they might actually not have been letters that were ever sent it might be that the form of the letter was a useful um, medium for someone to talk about a specific issue. And with Lady Mary Wortley Montagu, a lot of the actual letters in her hand that she wrote do not survive. So we don't actually know how many of the letters in this manuscript that go on to be published are actually sent to people. And when you read them, it's interesting to keep that in mind because then you see how often they have a theme like um, going into the Turkish baths, for example. Um, and so perhaps the addressee actually never received the letters that are addressed to them in the book. But the point is that she has these manuscript clean copies of letters that she's written and she's kept them with them with her throughout her life. Um, she she we know that she showed them to people at some point. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll talk about one important woman writer that we know she showed them to. Um, but these were something that she had kept with her. So that gives us a degree of, of understanding that these were things that she thought were important. She's kept her own copies of them. So she gets to Rotterdam. She essentially knows she's dying and she's about to head back to England. As I mentioned, her, her daughter is now a count. She's the Countess of Butte. And Lady Mary has become this uh, figure of, of scandal. Um, so there's a nervousness there's a slight uneasiness um, between their relationship to a certain degree, but we don't know exactly what Lady Mary Wortley Montague was thinking, but we have a good sense that she probably thought, if I give this manuscript of my travel letters to my daughter, no one's gonna see them again. Um, and that actually is the case for the journal, her private diaries that she did keep and give to her daughter. Her daughter read them, her daughter let one of her children read them and then burned them before she died. So she sort of had the right, she had the right idea, perhaps, about what her daughter might do with her works. So she's at Rotterdam. This is the last point before she's going to go back to England. And 
I think we can infer she wants her letters to be published, even though they were written such a long time ago. So this is where the story becomes slightly bizarre in that she somehow meets a man called Reverend Benjamin Salden. He was an Episcopal um, uh, uh, priest, uh, sorry, Reverend out in Rotterdam. He was English. And she literally just gives him these manuscript bound um, copies of her letters. And according to him, she tells him to dispose of them as he sees fit after she dies. So the fate of um, the um, this book is residing in the hands of a not particularly well-known reverend in Rotterdam at this point. Um, Lady Mary Watley Montague comes back to England. She does end up dying. Um, and then that's where um, the, the story of the letters publication comes into play because uh, Benjamin Salden gets in touch with uh, Lady Mary's family and says, oh, I, this manuscript that your mother left, um, what do you think about that? You think that's probably the last thing that she was expecting him to do, um, but he does get in touch. And um, there's different ideas about whether he was trying to make money out of this or not, but he ends up saying, I'll accept 200 pounds and you can have the manuscript. So the manuscript makes its way to the Countess of Butte. The family had been really anxious uh, to find out what was in it and to avoid it becoming public. However, it does become public and apparently the family are outraged and confused. And they go back to Reverend Salden and he says, well, the only thing I can think is that there were two English travelers that did stay with me whilst, um, whilst I had this manuscript and I, I let them read it. And um, they accidentally took it home with them, but they, they brought it back the next day. So we can imagine that these English travelers spent a long night up quickly copying the text from this manuscript um, onto pages of their own so that they had a copy of it. This gets snuck to a printer, the printers T. Beckett and, um, and P.A. de Hond, and then lo and behold, the letters of Lady Mo Mary Wortley Montague appear in 1763. So I might be harping on this point a lot, but I think it's so unusual for us to think today about there just being one copy of something. You know, we do things digitally, we take photocopies. There only was this copy of the manuscript. Well, having said that, there perhaps was another copy. Um, I'm contradicting myself immediately because there is some evidence that there was another copy that perhaps was given to some other friends, which gives us more of a view that Lady Mary did want these letters to be published. But really without these manuscript copies, there is no way of work coming to print. And if the family had had their way, it certainly wouldn't at all. So how does that link to Camden Archives and Local Study Centre? Well, that is through the fact that um, in 1948, or at least that's when it was first um, reported, someone called Pen Penelope E. Morgan, you can see a typewritten letter from her here, discovers um, in the papers of a poet uh, called William Beatty. Um, so his manuscript papers have been collected and they're going to be donated to an archive to look after them, deposited, I mean, and within them discovers this cache of papers, all of these individual sheets of paper, and establishes that they are the Turkish embassy letters in handwritten manuscript form. So this is, it go, we've gone from 16, 1763 or 1762 to some sneaky Englishman copying out a manuscript. And for all that time, no one had known what the copy of Lady Mary's letters was that had actually got to the printers because it was different from the copy that um, the family ends up buying back. It was different from another copy that is one that perhaps she gave to another friend. And so people would say, well, the printer's copy is missing. And in 1948, what we can say with pretty sure certainty um, the printer's copy is discovered. And that's the manuscript that I'm talking about today. Um, so rather remarkably, that's why it ends up in what's now Camden Archives. Um, it was deposited at different, different libraries within Camden and now um, part of the collection. And this is a letter from the reference librarian at Finchley Road Central Library, uh, writing to the woman asking, do you have any information about this? I guess they wanted to update their catalogue records. Um, so, well, what's in, what's in the manuscript? What does it look like? 
And I'm really excited to be able to share some of these images, thanks to, oops, um, thanks to um, Tudor and the Archive Centre. And particularly, I'm showing you some images that provide evidence that this actually is the copy that was used by the printers. So the image you're seeing here on the left, as you'll see, it's a piece of paper that's very dogged. It's got lots of scratches through it. It's got underlinings. And what this is, without a doubt, is the editor of Lady Mary Wortley Montague's letters, who isn't named in the volume, working out what they're going to say at the outset of the volume. Bear in mind that these are published, these aren't an authorised publication, the family think they bought them, they've got to somehow justify why they're doing this, but also this is their first opportunity to intrigue readers and, and, um, and bring them in. Um, so what's fantastic about this is not only can we see um, parts of what then ends up being printed in the text, but we can see the bits that didn't make it in. So the editor is basically saying, um, and this is my sort of um, first attempt at a transcript on the side, there are lots of, sort of deletions and some things that are legible. He's basically saying the reason why we're publishing them is because it was the manifest intention of the late lady, and then, you know, our plausible deniability dashes, um, that this select collection underlined of her letters should be communicated to the public. Um, what's interesting is the bit that's been crossed out is, a more explicit way of addressing the fact that oh, the family might not be very happy about this. Um, you can see that they said that he perhaps the family had an excessive and ill-grounded anxiety about um, delicacy and we wouldn't want them to refuse the world these copies, which is true. But it's interesting that that doesn't make it into the final, final copy. Um, so this is really clear evidence that this collection of manuscript papers is something to do with the printers because why else would you have something that's really working out and changing the wording that becomes published? Um, there's another preface that goes with the um, with the letters and um, and also this is this is what I mean by a cache of manuscript papers. Imagine sort of a a normal sort of um, oh, I can't think of the exact size, but a normal sort of notebook sized paper. That's the sort of sizing that we're looking at here. And so this is. This is the manuscript. There's that first page in a different hand, we think to be the editor. And then there's a very beautiful scribal hand that's writing the rest of the text. And um, information with this that make us know or gives us evidence that this is likely, highly likely, the text that the printers used are things like, on the right hand side, you might see words that are capitalized, ladies and lords. That's how it is in the text. Lines, um, words that are underlined are in italics in the text. And these things correspond um, directly. Whatever, how it is in the manuscript is exactly that by that sort of uh, convention is the same as it is in the printed text. Um, this is actually a preface written by um, another woman writer, Mary Astell, um, when she had a chance to see the letters in 1724. And this is one of the, this, uh, the, um, the verso of this sheet, which is on the right, is one of the things I've been lucky enough to display in my exhibition, because it is a fantastically um, powerful um, uh, declaration of why these letters are important and why they should be published. 1724, Lady Mary Wortley Montague wasn't ready to do this. But if you look on the right, you can see this wonderful sentence. I confess I'm malicious enough to desire that the world should see how much better um, the ladies travel than their lords. And whilst it is surfeited with male travels, they're all in the same tone, the same stuff in them, ladies have the skill to strike out a new path and give something fresh and new. Um, which is, yeah, it's a fantastic uh, statement. And you see here, she signed, she signed here MA, which stands for um, Mary Astle. And her final line is saying that she wants these letters to show the genius of, of women. Um, so for her, this being published was absolutely um, a feminist act and a demonstration of why women were, should be in the, in the marketplace of literature. So what you're seeing on the left here, I'm pointing out some of the other things, evidence from the manuscript that can show us that this was used by the printers. And so you see here, I've got a line between, this is the printed page of um, the first edition, and on the left we have the page from the manuscript. Now it says either the exemplary discretion, and between exemplary and discretion we've got this little line, and then on in the margin it says Voltu D33. 
Now, page 33, that, this is basically, it's part of the, um, the collation information. So when you're making a book from manuscript, the person who's setting the page needs to know when do the pages break? Sort of how long do I go with my text? And the person who has annotated this manuscript is saying here, after exemplary, then you move on to D33. So I won't explain all of the, um, the slightly complicated things of collation formula, but you'll see at the bottom on the right, we've got, this is volume two, it's D, and then you can see 33 up here. And lo and behold, that page begins where that line is with discretion. And that is consistent throughout the text. All of these marks that we have correspond to when the pages break in the real text. So what, what's in these letters? Why are they so good? So this is an example of one of the letters that is um, so uh, interesting to read and important for what it is that Lady Mary communicates about life in Turkey, specifically Turkish women, back to the English public, even though it's decades after she observed it. Um, so I've got um, a transcription or the text on, on the right hand side, so it's a bit more readable, though this script is wonderful. So she says, she's, she's writing to, it's actually to her sister she's writing to, and she's basically saying, we have this idea that, you know, a Muslim country, we're Christians, therefore um, they, that we should see them as, um, as a sinning in some, in some respect. They don't follow our religion. We've got all of these ideas about what Muslim life might be based on um, anything from myth to sort of um, small accounts from other travelers. But she's saying, I've been here and I've spoken to women. And of course we must remember she's a very upper class woman. So she's walking like going in certain circles, but she says, as to their morality or their good conduct, tis just as tis just as tis with you. And the Turkish ladies don't commit one sin the less for not being Christians. Um, she talks about the extreme stupidity that other writers must have to have given the account of them because she just thinks it's so inaccurate. And then she famously says the line, and, and this text on the side, I've, I've compiled it together so you can read it all the way through. It is very easy to see they have in reality more liberty than we have. No woman of what rank soever is permitted to go into the streets without two Merlins, one that covers her face all but her eyes, and another that hides the whole of her dress and hangs halfway down her back. So you might initially think, well, she's saying that they have liberty, but she's talking about a very specific manner of dressing, um, which could be seen as the opposite of that. But for her, based on her experience of being a woman in London, she's saying, actually, I think this gives them a lot of liberty because they have anonymity. They're disguised. No one knows who is who when walking around on the streets. You can't see rank. Um, you, uh, she then goes into quite a lot of detail about how women conduct affairs because their husbands wouldn't notice them on the streets. Um, and then she also says that no man dare touch or follow a woman in the street. So this idea of the way that women are being required to, uh, to dress is also linked with how she sees them being treated within society. Um, so rather than seeing this practice, which is so different from her as um, she's attempting and looking to see the ways in which um, this um, is something that is experienced as liberating for women. And she's particularly comparing it to her own experience. We see a real curiosity and a desire for her to understand why women's lives are this way in this culture. Um, she also talks about that when she goes to the Turkish baths, a space, you know, divided by um, male and female, a space that men never would have been able to go into. She gets invited into the harem of the Sultan um, and so can actually write about it for the first time. And she focuses both on the ways in which um, women are um, required to behave uh, by men, but also on the ways in which they uh, can mm. own property and the ways in which they can have their own um, uh, independence. So she's it's it's a really interesting example of someone trying to understand and, and penetrate and uh interestingly amusingly enough she talks about having um how sort of horrified the women that she meets are with her whalebone corset and they see it as this sort of restrictive machine that she has no power to get out of until her husband lets her so it shows you how cultural exchange can cultural can can make us consider our own cultures in different ways 
Another area that she uh, she talks about a lot um, and is one of the sort of really interesting aspects of her letters that has a huge effect is observing the practice of inoculation against smallpox. So smallpox at this time would run ravage through cities. Uh, it would kill people. It almost killed Lady Mary Mortley Montagu when she contracted it, um, as I, sh I mentioned earlier in 1715 before she goes to Turkey. But she goes to these Turkish bars, she sees these beautiful women, everyone's naked, wonderful sort of smooth skin, she remarks about, where she's sort of got pockmarked skin. And in one of her letters, she writes and says, I'm going to tell you something that will make you wish you're here. you were here. The smallpox so fatal and general amongst us is here entirely harmless by the invention of engrafting. That's the term that was used at the time. She talks about these women that come every September and basically have, and this is a little bit gory, a little nutshell that they fill with pus from smallpox pustules. And what they have, what they've been doing in Turkey, as well as also, this was also happening in China, um, is realizing that if you do a small scratch in someone's skin, you put a bit of the pus in, um, they will contract smallpox, but in very mild form. And in the vast majority of cases, as is recorded, will be ill for a small period of time, within 10 days be recovered. Um, and then they will have natural immunity. So this is not vaccination, which uh, we get with Edward Jenner's discoveries of using cowpox to protect against smallpox in the 1790s. But this is totally the beginning of that science. And Lady Mary has no, no qualms about it at all. She says, literally, you, you best believe that I will get it, that I believe that process is safe because I'm gonna have my son engrafted. And I love this line. She says that the French ambassador says pleasantly that here they take the smallpox by way of diversion as they take the waters in other countries. So this could be something that was seen as really quite scary. She knows how awful smallpox can be, but she's not, she's not worried about it. She's like, I've seen the procedure, even though you could say it doesn't look particularly scientific in the way that science was perhaps being practiced in England. She's like, I've seen it, it works. I don't want my son to die from smallpox. And, uh, and she does get him um, engrafted as it were. And this is actually, this is the only letter here that isn't in Camden archives that I'm looking at. This is the actual letter where she writes to her husband saying that she's had um, uh, her son protected against smallpox. This is in Sheffield City archives and um, I've zoomed in a bit on it on the right. Amongst sort of accounts of uh, you know household goings on she says the boy was engrafted last Tuesday and is at this time singing and playing very impatient for his supper. So she's not too worried about him at this point. Um, and this is actually a painting uh, of Lady Mary Watley Montague in Turkey um, with her son here. So this is the young son, um, Edward Wortley, who sadly she becomes um, estranged from, uh, who has been inoculated against smallpox. Um, so Lady Mary actually does do, as she says she was in, in this letter, she does make a real effort to campaign for inoculation to become the practice in England. It was being filtered back through to the Royal Society, um, but there was a huge, um, uh, income stream for doctors around the slightly more quackish manners of protecting and there was a lot of skepticism about this practice in huge part because it was it was Middle East and it was seen as foreign when she actually writes a letter that gets published in support of it she doesn't say that it's written by her or by a woman because that would also be another thing that you could throw against it but, and this is a whole talk for another time, she does an awful lot whilst the scientific community is starting to embrace this idea of inoculation. She does an awful lot to win over, win the propaganda war basically against the 18th century equivalent of anti-vaxxers because she gets the princess of Wales to have her children, not her son, her daughters, that would have been a bit risky, inoculated. And um, because Lady Mary, this, this little girl that she says here, I can't engraft because her nurse has not had smallpox. In 1721, she becomes the first person on British soil to be inoculated against smallpox. And from the 1720s, it becomes the British practice to inoculate everyone. And Edward Jenner is inoculated against smallpox in this manner. So she really has an important ongoing legacy in, um, in winning the PR war on this um, scientific move forward. So um, this is just interesting. This is much later, but you'll see, it's rather nice to see within um, some engravings of a lot of great men of science with their wigs that someone has had the, uh, 
the foresight and the uh, and the knowledge to include Lady Mary Watley Montague here. So part four, and um, I need to keep myself on track because I am pretty much already on time. Um, this is this new research that I've been doing um, into the archives at Camden, which has been really exciting, basically because I think you can see from some of this anecdotal evidence like the, um, uh, the working through of the advertisement um, that was kept with the papers, that these are the, the printer's copies. But there's more that you can back up that story with. Um, William Beattie was friends, whose papers these were found in, was friends with Andrew Beckett, who was the son of Thomas Beckett, and who worked with him in his printer shop, and also was a writer himself and was friends with a lot of writers. And there's evidence that important manuscripts have been circulated and found within other people's papers. So it seems like this manuscript was kept by the printer, passed to his son, who then passes it to William Beatty. Um, but there are also clues within the paper itself that we could use to try and pin down um, uh, or try and look for evidence for when this um, this text was written, because we don't know if this was the text that the the Englishman who copied it from Salden's manuscript wrote, or if this is an entirely new clean copy that once that text has come to England, a scribe at the publishers has written out. That would be my inkling, guessed on how sort of based on how. Um, how nice and even the script is. Um, but is there any evidence within the papers that can help us date them? Because um, manuscripts are fraudulently created um, and people can get quite creative with that. So there's more evidence we have of possible to sort of reveal the hidden history of the paper, the more that we can um, say with confidence exactly that these are this really crucial, important link between the first manuscript of Lady Mary Watley Montague and the printed book, which is the reason why we can read her today. So hugely important. The image I have here is an um, image of some of the watermarks within these pages. And um, it's quite hard to see. So hopefully, because the way that you take photographs of watermarks is you, you have light underneath them to shine up. Um, but obviously we have to be very careful with light and manuscript items. Um, just very briefly, watermarks we often think of, well, it has the metaphorical meaning now of having a mark on something so that other people can't steal it. Um, but it is a printing term. It comes from the way you made paper at the time, this called laid paper, was um, by getting together pulp. Um, interestingly, not wood pulp until the 19th century. It was rags, it's cotton and linen, which is why older paper has this lovely sort of thick quality to it. You got together a pulp um, and you spread it out over um, a wire mesh was pressed down and that's why you have you can see on this paper you can see there's lines going um uh, some thin lines together going um horizontally and then further apart these lines going vertically and that helps us know how the paper was made um but within those meshes uh really early on people started basically um making little designs in the wire so that when the paper was made you'd have this image this pattern um, sort of printed into it, and that's a watermark. Um, this is an example of one of the first watermarks that caught my eye when I was reading um, the manuscript works. And um, you might be able to see, here's another example. They appear at different points on the page. Here, you can probably just about see that there's some letters. It looks to say SCK, and I've, the lines show um, where I've zoomed in on that. And you can also see more of what looks very similar to that pattern you're seeing up here. And the thing about watermarks is where they appear on the page very much depends on how that big initial sheet of paper has been cut up and folded into smaller ones. Um, so, um, so it can also help us um, know about sort of how the paper ended up being used. But I was particularly interested to try and say, will this tell me anything about who made the paper and when it's from? So this, there are watermarks and then there are also, ah, oh, damn it, that was my big reveal. There are watermarks and there are countermarks. So the terms get used a bit interchangeably, but basically the watermark would usually be this symbolic image and it becomes used to identify um, the, the type of paper that's been made. You know, once you get a sheet of paper, you might not necessarily know the quality. So if it's got a specific mark in it in the mill, you can divide it up. And then countermarks come in more and more to tell us um, who made the paper, gonna have a name. Um, 
when was that what mill made the paper what person what date in England from 1794 you actually have to have a date on all of your paper um but look here we go if you if you look at the pages in the leaves and you put them together then you can see what the whole watermark looks like and and that's what you're seeing here so this is actually what's called a post horn. It was a very popular watermark. Um, it came from this idea of having this image of a postman with his bag and his horn announcing that the mail was here. And so there's a natural link between, between paper, obviously, and post. And this watermark actually increasingly became used for this lighter weight of paper that would be used for things like letters. Uh, so this kind of shows you the sort of hidden uh, secrets within some of the manuscripts. But so that's one of the watermarks I found on the paper. Um, here's another one. You can hopefully see in the top um, in the top left, you can see GR. And then hopefully down here, you can see that I've again put the piece of paper together to show you the full image. It's GR and there's a crown above it. So what do these things mean? What do they tell me? Well, the first thing that they tell me, and also these are just some examples. Um, Here's a list of, and there are more than these, but here's a list of some of the watermarks and countermarks I found in the manuscript. So you can see C and I Honig, I literally mean that that word that written like that is, um, is in the paper. Sometimes you have to sort of put the piece of paper together, like I said, um, also the word Vandalay that you see in the paper. And um, I wish I had better photographs to show you because it's quite miraculous and exciting when you sort of see it appear. Um, but um, all of these paper makers, all of the papers so far, that um, all of the paper makers identified so far show that this paper is Dutch. It would be very tempting to say, aha, this is evidence that this is the paper used by the copyists because they were in the Netherlands. But Dutch paper was very common. Holland, north, north of um, the Netherlands, was a province that made an awful lot of paper. And you can see some of the information I put about these different, these different Dutch mills. And they specifically would make paper also for the English market. So the fact that we have this GR and a crown, which is a countermark used to show that paper was produced during the reign of King George III, 1738 to 1820, um, it doesn't mean it was made in England necessarily because Dutch paper would be made to conform to the system of quality that was needed in England. Um, but as you can see, you can start to piece together from this information at the very least a time before which the paper couldn't have been produced. So we've got 1730 is when the countermark CNI Honig was first used and 1738 when the George III crown was used. Now, it would be incredible to be able to say the exact date of the paper, but then even then, if we could, that wouldn't actually say that that's when it was written on because paper can be used many years, maybe even a decade after it comes out of the mill. But what I'm starting to do with this research, and I hope to narrow down even more, is um, what can we learn from the paper that these um, manuscripts were written on? Does it help us tie them to a printer? Um, does it help us clarify if this is the scribal copy uh, or if this is a copy that was made um, in Rotterdam? Um, and so it all adds up to being able to give more of the story behind how these letters actually came to be. Um, I will, I'm very close to finishing Tudor, sorry, I've run on a little bit, um, but I just wanted to finally um, uh, highlight this post horn uh, that I showed you earlier. That is the watermark that I see throughout these manuscripts, even when there's a different countermark, like a different name. It's very, um, it's very consistent. Um, and it is a post horn sort of within the design of a shield. Um, and so what I'm really keen to do more of um, is investigate other examples of when that's been used um, as a watermark. There are lots of great uh, bibliographic works that you can pin it down and um, and produce a, um, a clear drawing and clear images of some of these sort of hidden water encounter marks within the manuscript. So um, thank you so much. I'm coming to the end of my, um, my talk now. I did just want to leave up on the screen um, some further reading in case people are interested either in some of this paper research I was talking about or Lady Mary Watley Montague and indeed some of the um, issues around uh, travel writing today. Um, these are some really good sort of early, um, either 
scholarly or accessible works. Um, but thank you very much. As uh, Trudeau and Kate kindly mentioned, um, Lady Mary Watley Montague is one of the women that I profile in my exhibition, Trailblazers, Women Travel Writers and the Exchange of Knowledge, which has got one more month on display. Um, and you can see um, those three letters, uh, two letters from Lady Mary Watley Montague and the preface uh, by Mary Astell are on display. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, I'll pass it back to Tudor now. Thank you. Well, um, Emma, uh, there was really no need to apologise for going over time. <laughs> Certainly no need to apologise. I mean, that was a real treat. Um, and thank you for sharing your clearly expert knowledge of Lady Montague and her letters and your enthusiasm uh, for the subject. It really comes across very, very evidently. So uh, a really, I found that a really engrossing talk that I learned so much from. Thank you so much. Um, so now um, we are going to I just ask my colleague Kate, could you stop recording? <laughs>